Nehemiah chapter 13. We'll begin reading at verse 1. have it say amen. All right. Okay. I'm going to begin. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. On that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So it was when they had heard the law that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. Now before this, Elisha the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, was allied with Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a large room where previously they had stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers and the offerings for the priests. But during all this, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem and discovered the evil that Elisha had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me bitterly. Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms, and I brought back into them the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them, for each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So I contended with the rulers, and I said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in place. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse Shelemiah the priest, and Zadok the scribe, and of the Levites, Padiah. And next to them was Hanan, the son of Zachar the son of Madaniah, for they were considered faithful and their task was to distribute to their brethren. Remember me, O God, concerning this and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for its services. Say amen with me. All right, you may be seated. I'm going to talk to you, I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, beware of compromise. Beware of compromise. Compromise can be a a good thing, or compromise can be a bad thing. It depends. If there are two parties that cannot get along and cannot come to an agreement, and you get someone who can help them to come to a place where they can agree, or someone who can help them to see where maybe if you give a little here and you give a little over there, then maybe you can come together and you can work together and compromise so that things will work better. In a sense like that, when two people can come to an agreement because one has to either give up something, and the other has to give up something. 
or somewhere they reach an agreement. That's compromise. Compromise, on the other hand, can be negative. Because remember, when it comes to compromise, in just about all cases, someone's given a little here or a little there. They're giving up something to come to that agreement. But sometimes compromise requires you to give up things that you don't want to give up. Compromise may require that you let go of something that you really should keep or hold on to because you think that sometimes it may be better this way or it may get you something that you need or I should say that you want or desire. Sometimes what we do is we give in to things that we should not. That's when compromise is not good. You know, sometimes you can think that, even sometimes, think of the, the good part. Like, sometimes in a, in a marriage or a relationship, sometimes you have to do a little bit of compromising because if you just want to do it this way and the other party want to do it that way, there could be problems. So sometimes you have to do a little bit of compromising. Agree? But what I want you to see today is that we have to beware of compromise because not all compromise then is good. And the enemy's job is to get us to compromise our faith, compromise our values, compromise our trust in God, compromise in different ways, and lose sometimes the very thing that we want to hold on to that is good for us, that benefits us. You and I, we are all bombarded with opportunities to compromise. And the truth is that they may not all stick out like a sore thumb, like the betrayal of Jesus or the denial, but compromise can be subtle. It's not always something that stands out that we can recognize it right there and then, or we can say that's compromise. Sometimes it's subtle. Like, for instance, a little bit of past, maybe, on prayer. If you're a person of, of prayer, you're a person who believes in prayer, you're, you're, you're a person who spends time in prayer, take time to pray. A little, a little past on prayer, a couple of times, well, too busy. I, 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 I can't, I don't have time right now. And you do it once, you do it, you do it a couple of times. And eventually, your prayer time slows down, or eventually, your prayer time can become non existent. Because the compromise is I got to get to work, I can't do it today. I'm going to be late. I can't do it today. And a little bit of that and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. A little peek at the wrong thing can lead to compromise. A, 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 a lie told to get out of responsibility to escape maybe a promise that you made can lead to compromise. 
given in to sin that one time, given in to disobedience that one time, can lead to a period or even a lifetime of compromise. The idea, the thought that I can get away with certain actions at a certain time or I can get away with a certain action this time while no one is around to see me or to see what I'm doing and because I don't have to answer to no one can lead to compromise. And that's just what happened with Elisha, the priest. The moment that Nehemiah was gone, because he returned to the king for a little bit, the moment the visionary was gone, because this was the one who came and said, let's rebuild the walls. In that moment, that time span that Nehemiah was gone, things begin to go in a different direction. No one took up the vision that Nehemiah had brought to them to run with it. Instead, it led to a series of compromises. Elisha the priest was very aware of the trouble and the threats that Tobiah previously was creating for the people of Jerusalem for the Jews as they were rebuilding the walls, as they brought themselves together. And, and you know, we, we've, we've walked through Nehemiah and we've seen how they went from not having walls to having walls, how they went from going, not even spending time in, in the law to seeing what the law said and to coming together and having a great time and rejoicing. I believe the last... Um, chapter that we looked at, they were celebrating that the walls were completed. But here, Elisha has given Tobiah a place, a room in the temple. This is the same Tobiah who along with the other enemies of the Jews had sought to stop them from building the walls, had laughed at them, had mocked them. And yet, this man who had posed a threat to them, Tobiah allows, not Tobiah, but Elisha allows and gives him a room in the temple. He acted inappropriately while Nehemiah was gone, although he knew the threat that was posed to his own people. And so I believe that when we take what has been dedicated to God, whether that is our life, something that represents our gifts, whether it's our talent, whether it is our bodies, or anything else, and we bargain it away or we use it in exchange for friendship, in exchange for perks, in exchange for benefits or incentives or what have you, we are in danger of compromising our faith and even compromising the gospel which we have received. And the end result of compromise can lead to demise. My mom used to tell me, you, you, you always hear me say a, a number of things that my mom used to, you know, say to me. My mom used to say to me, if you play with fire, you know it, you're going to get burned. You heard that? A lot of other things she said. If you play with fire, 
you will get burned because eventually something is going to get compromised. That's what she's trying to teach me. So watch out. I draw it to you when I think, when I thought about that, I thought about Judas. When Judas sold out Jesus, it didn't happen suddenly. It happened little by little. It was compromised little by little. Every time, because the Bible says that Judas used to help himself to the money bag. He carried the money with the ministry of Jesus as they would go around doing ministry from town to town. They had the bag with the money, whether to buy food or to supply the needs. Judas was the one who carried the bag around. And the Bible said that he helped himself to the money. Mm -hmm. What I want you to see is every time... He helped himself to the money. He was compromising his integrity. Every time he found a reason or an excuse to take out a coin, a denarii, whatever it is to spend, he was compromising. Little by little. So when he went out to meet with the chief priest to sell out Jesus, Compromise was already in place in his life. He was already compromising. So the little that he was taking, little by little, and now he was going to get 30 pieces of silver. Well, if he's already been compromising, 30 pieces of silver seems like a lot of money, doesn't it? And that was more attractive, and that was more important to him than his friendship with Jesus. Compromise. You, you may say, well, that's not a friend. A friend doesn't do things like that. But Jesus did acknowledge him as a friend. Jesus told his disciples, I, I don't call you servants, I call you friends. And so even when Judas came with the people from the high priest to uh, uh, arrest Jesus, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 26, 48 and verse 50, that he had given the people a sign that whomever he kissed, that's going to be the one that they needed to arrest. And he went up to Jesus and he kissed him and he greeted them. But Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Jesus called him friend, even knowing what he had already done. He compromised his friendship with Christ for something that was worth far less, and it led to his demise. And you may say, I, I would never do something like that. I would never betray Jesus. But can we be so sure of that? Peter said he would never deny him, and he did. He acted out of fear, and his faith was on the line. For Judas, it was greed and the satisfaction that came from the access that he had to the money for which he was responsible and so he saw another opportunity to acquire more money. And he compromised his relationship and his friendship with Jesus. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what holds sway over our lives? What, what is that thing that may currently be present in our lives? Or that thing that is making its way into our hearts and into our lives because we're doing it little by little. What is it that can lead to compromise of our relationship with Christ? What, what might happen or what may be happening in your life or what might there be 
that you can replace or might be tempted to replace your commitment in your relationship with Christ. Could it be money? It could be. Could it be sex? It could be. It could be an, an offer that seems too good to refuse. It can be a chance to make it big, to have a big name, to, 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 to make it big in the world. It could be an opportunity just to make a name for yourself. Or it could even be serving for the applause of man, to get the attention of man. All of these things and more can lead to compromise. And it can happen little by little. And the question that we have to ask ourselves, is there something that might create for us an opportunity to compromise that would take the place of our commitment to Christ or might cause us to compromise on our faith. Something for us to think about. Nehemiah comes back to Jerusalem and he discovers that There has been an indiscretion on the part of the priest. The priest, the one who should be leading the people. The priest, the one who should be leading by example. The priest who should be the one who was making sure that the temple was being used for worship, for what it was built for. He didn't. He discovered that he had taken all of the equipment out of the room. He had taken all of the offerings that the people would bring. And he removed them. He cleared out the room in the temple to give Tobiah, who was an enemy of the Jews, a room. To reside in. And when Nehemiah discovered this indiscretion on Elijah's part, he threw everything out. All his household goods he removed and he cleansed the temple. And he restored the equipment that was removed and he restored the grain offerings and the incense. He put them back in their rightful place. And I thought of Nehemiah in my, in my mind as I picture him throwing things out in the street and throwing things out wherever he threw them out. He, he, he just threw them out. Nehemiah, I thought of Nehemiah's passion was, was reminiscent of the zeal that Jesus had when he came to the temple and he found when he came into the temple that there were money changers in the temple, that they were just exchanging money and they were selling sheep and oxen, animals, doves and everything in the temple. And Jesus felt some kind of way about it. And the Bible tells us that he threw, he overthrew the, the tables of the money changers and he poured out their money and he chased them out of the temple. And he said, this, is, this house shall be called a house of prayer, my father's house, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he threw them out. And see, I, I believe as believers we have to be zealous and, and, and recognize what we have in Christ. And the moment that we feel or we see ourselves in, in a place where we're tempted to compromise, we need to get rid of that thing or those things. We need to avoid those things that will cause us to compromise. The question is, is our zeal alive? Is our passion still alive? Because when you are zealous about something, 
when you are passionate about something, you keep focusing on that. You are excited about that. When you are passionate about something, you are more careful about giving access to it. Are you with me? When you are passionate about something, you are more careful about who you let in, who you give access to, and who you allow to take you away from it. Paul told the church at Rome when he wrote the letter to the Romans, he said, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. He said, and then he tells, said to them, a, a verse or two down, he says, never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. In other words, do not let your love go lukewarm or cold. Keep your zeal. Do not let your fire burn out. Because when love becomes lukewarm, when passion, when love becomes lukewarm, passion fades. When your love for Christ becomes lukewarm, zeal fades. When love goes cold, zeal dies. So Paul was writing to the Romans. He said, keep love sincere and keep your spiritual passion. Keep your fire. Let your love be real. Are, are you with me, church? When you love someone sincerely, you are passionate about them. Mm -hmm. Passionate about what you will do for them. When, you're, when your love is, is, is sincere, when it's real, when it's that burning kind of love. Eliashib had allowed things to go in a different direction. His a love for the temple, his love for the presence of the Lord, his love for what God had given somehow was being compromised. Whether he wanted the attention of Tobiah, whether he wanted something from Tobiah, the problem is what he did signal compromise. Nehemiah, on the other hand, was passionate about God, was passionate about the temple, was passionate about his God. And I, I want you to watch something because it's not only what Eliashib has done that shows compromise. It was not only his dedicating the storeroom to Tobiah that signaled compromise, but when you read that passage of scripture, we will notice that because of the, their neglect in reading or in listening to the laws, the people weren't studying the law and reading as they should the laws that were given to them by Moses. And so the people omitted to follow what God had decreed concerning the Ammonites and the Moabites. When Israel were going to the promised land or en route to Canaan, when they came to the land of the Ammonites and the Moabites, these two nations together hired Balaam to curse Israel because he, they had heard of all the things that Israel was, ha was happening to Israel, how the Red Sea was open and how, how God had blessed them and how they were, were a, this great nation that was coming across the land. And the Ammonites and the Mormites said, we've got to do something about them. And so they hired Balaam to curse them. And because of this, they didn't even give them anything to 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 provide for their hunger and their thirst, knowing that they were traveling in the hot sun, knowing that they were traveling days on end. And if you remember, the Ammonites and the Moabites were descendants of Abram's nephew, Lot. So in some ways, they were related to Israel. 
but they didn't help any. And the Lord had said, because of this, God had declared them ineligible to be admitted into the assembly of God. It was not until they began to get more and more into the word and in hearing the law and reading the law that Moses had given them and in studying, did the people realize that the Ammonites and the Moabites were not supposed to be allowed into the assembly. And the Bible tells us here in this passage, after hearing this law, the people elected to exclude the Ammonites and the Moabites. Is it because they did not know? Is it because they had forgotten? Well, I submit to you that it is because for a long time, the people had neglected the regular practice of reading and studying the law. It had become a less used item on their agenda and it led to their compromise. The more reasons you have for not studying the word, the more reasons you have for not reading the word, the more excuses you come up with for not getting into the word of God, the more your faith is being compromised because the Bible says faith comes comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so when we lack that ability to hear, the more we are compromising our faith, the more and more we find reasons and excuses not to get into the word. Now, in securing a place for Tobiah, that meant that there was no place to store the portions that should have been given to the Levites, the portion that should have been given to the priests. And so they lacked the support, the priests and the Levites lacked the support to carry out the word of God. And just what, guess what happens? They all went back to doing the work they were doing before. They went back to their fields. These were the Levites, the ones who did the service in the, in the temple. These were the singers, the ones who sang, and, the, and some of the priests. They went back to their fields to earn a living. This is what I want us to understand. Compromise not only hurts you, compromise hurts the people around you. Compromise doesn't hurt just you. It hurts others around you. It's like a, we call a trickle down effect. And so when Nehemiah recognized what all that was happening, Nehemiah rebuked the officials who were in charge and he replaced them with those who were considered trustworthy. He removed Eliashib. He removed those who were in charge because they weren't doing due diligence. And he replaced them with those who were honest and reliable and upright and faithful. Does trustworthiness count for anything? Isn't it important to have people around you who you can trust? Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said in Luke chapter 16 and verse 10, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. And yes, in, in this context that Jesus is talking about, he's talking about money. He says, if you, if, if you are faithful with a little bit of money, you'll be faithful with a lot of money. Do you, do, 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 do you, see, do you, do you see the picture, even with, 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 with Judas? Because he wasn't faithful with a little bag, money that he had in the little bag? Mm-hmm. 
If the person is faithful with a little, they will be faithful with much. He's talking in the context of money, but I want you to know that this statement can be applied to many other things in our lives. In other words, if you can be trusted with a little responsibility, you can be trusted with much responsibility. If you are honest with the little that you have, you will be honest when you have much. You know, I hear people say, you know, if, if, if I had this, I will do this. If I had, you know, it, it's funny, I don't know where my mind goes back to that, but when I was working in, in, in <laughs> I, I don't want to call a name, no, but when I was, was, was working in, in the commercial world, so to speak, so I had some, <laughs> some of my coworkers, you know, they, they, will, they will go, when, when their, the lottery thing is a million dollars and all that, they, would, they will get together and they'll put money together and they will go out and buy the tickets. The one particular girl, she always comes to me, she says, I know you're not going to do it, but I'm going to put something in for you. <laughs> And, 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 and so when we win, we're going to divide it up so you will get some too. And I used to laugh to myself because if, if, if you can't show me that kind of support in other things, how can I believe you and trust you that when you have a lot of other things that you're going to count me in? Are, are you with me? I always, and you've heard me talk this, I've taught my kids, you, you, you need to learn how to spend within your means and what you have, the little that you have. You know, sometimes we'll be saying, you know, when I got a lot of money, this is what I'm going to do. When I got a lot, and I know you've heard this, when I've got a lot of money, I, 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 I'm going to give to the church and make sure, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, right. If you don't give when you have a little, you're not going to give when you have a lot. We all know the, how that works. If, if I'm not going to be responsible with the little I have, how am I going to be responsible? And Jesus even went on to say, if you are not responsible, if you're not faithful with, some, with what you have, with someone else's goods, how are you going to be faithful with your own? And here is the thing, even when, when, we, when, when we have something and we're not faithful with that that belongs to someone else, if I am not faithful on my job with the hours, if I'm not faithful on my job with going to work on time, if I'm not faithful on my job with doing things and, 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 and setting priorities and having time, you know, to do certain things and I do things with, listen, when I get my own, we say, well, you know what, if it was my own, I'm going, the problem is, who wants to give you your own? Because the same attitude with which you approach what belongs to someone else will trickle into your own. You say, no, no, but when it's my own, I'm going to do. When we compromise and we practice certain things, it becomes part of our character. Mm -hmm. If you're responsible with a little, you will be responsible with much. Even in Proverbs chapter 11, Verse 13, it says this, and that's why I'm saying that trustworthiness is important because Proverbs 11, 13 says, a gossip betrays confidence, but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. If I can trust you, I can tell you. If I can't trust you, 
because you're not trustworthy, I can't tell you. Because a gossip betrays a confidence. Nehemiah looked for people who he could trust, who were trustworthy to avoid the compromise. Men who would have been faithful. And in prob I believe Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, show you how important it is. In 1 Corinthians 4 and 2, Paul said, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. In other words, those of us who have been given the trust, what is given the trust of preaching the word, given the trust of, 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 of holding a position, those who have been given a trust are to prove faithful. And, and that doesn't apply only to preaching and teaching. It is responsibility. Any responsibility that we have been given, we must be faithful in living it out. Faithful in carrying it out. In Ephesians chapter 4 and 1, the Bible says we are called upon to walk worthy of the calling with which we are called. In other words, faithful in our calling. And lastly, in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 12, he, Paul writes that you would walk worthy. He said, I pray that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Trustworthy. Nehemiah was concerned with what Elisha had done by the opening the temple and giving him a room. He could no longer be trusted. Sometimes people are trusted because of their position, only to discover that they weren't trustworthy. Just because a person holds a certain position doesn't mean they're trustworthy. Are you with me? Just because I have a title doesn't mean that I'm trustworthy. Are you with me? It, it, it's a character trait. Trustworthiness. A, a, and those who are called to serve the Lord are expected. Those who are given a trust. Those who are given a responsibility. Those to whom God has given talents and gifts. They are entrusted with those gifts and is expecting. In Colossians, Paul says that you will walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. It is important that those people who have been given a trust prove trustworthy. And the Bible says, Nehemiah chose trustworthy people to replace the one who was in the position of trust but failed to do so. A trustworthy person is less likely to compromise their values. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it's less likely. That is why it's important that every one of us as believers beware of compromise because fruitfulness and faithfulness goes hand in hand. And when you are a trustworthy person and can be trusted, faithfulness, is one of those characteristics. You are faithful in what you do. Brothers and sisters, you and I are called to be faithful, to walk worthy 
it's not just the person who is in a high position that is called to walk worthy. It is every one of us as believers that are called to walk worthy. And not just when you are being watched. When Nehemiah was in Jerusalem, they were doing what they were supposed to do. But the moment he left Jerusalem and he went away, the people begin to wander into sin. The people begin to do things that was not in line with what they had been taught. That was not in line with the word of God. That was not in line with the character of those who trust in God. Faithfulness, my friend, trustworthiness is a characteristic that shows up in our lives, not just when we are in the view of others, not just to get the attention of others, not just to make us look good. Trust. Worthiness shows up even in the dark. Even when others can't see what you're doing and others are not aware, a trustworthy person will be faithful. So the question for us, am I being faithful what God has given me. Can I be trusted with what God has given me? Or am I liable to compromise easily? Let me close with this. Jesus tells a story of a man who was going on a long journey and he calls his servants and he gave them talents. He gave one five, he gave one two, and he gave one one. And the person who had five went out and collected five more. The person with two went out and collected two more. But the person with one dug a hole in the ground and buried the talent. And so when the master came looking for his money, when he came back, the one with ten came and said, Master, you gave me with five, said, Master, you gave me five, and look what I did. I gained five more. The other with two says, Master, look, I got two. I didn't get five, but I got two. That's all right. So I went out, and I got two more. And the one with one came back and said, Master, I know, you, I know you're a tough cookie. So instead, I, I, I just buried it in the ground. So what? Here's your one. You can have it back. And Jesus looked at him and said, You wicked and slow food. You could have done better with my money even if you didn't go out. You could have put it in the bank or someplace where it could earn some, at least some interest. And then I'll have it when I come back. He looked at those who were doubled and he said, you've been faithful and they're in. You've been faithful with what I gave you. He took from the one who had the one and took it and gave it to the one who had doubled up the most. Hear what I'm saying. The little that he had, he was not faithful with it, and he lost it. He was not a trustworthy servant. 
and he lost what he had. Our character as believers calls for us to be trustworthy. Question is, can God trust you with what he's given you? Can he trust you with what you have? Whether little or a lot, can God trust you with what he's given you? What are you doing? What are we doing with what he has given us? Are we in the place like Elisha? Are we willing to compromise what God has already given us? Or are we willing to offer it back to him with more, multiply with what he first gave us. That's what God is counting on us. Not to compromise our faith. But the Bible says, add to your faith. Build it up. Add. Add other things. So that when you have added patience, all these other things to your faith. Goodness. Add to your faith you will be unstoppable. You will be grounded. Add to your faith. Do not compromise your faith, but add to it. A trustworthy person is expected to build on their faith and remain faithful, faithful, to the end. Amen? Amen? Faithful to the end. Let's pray.